We have just one scripture reading this morning. It's Acts chapter 2 from verse 14. This was Peter's sermon on Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 14. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to, ha my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel and therefore, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Pentecost means 50th, and it refers to the Feast of Weeks, or the Harvest Festival, which was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. So it was an ancient festival, but on this particular occasion, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2, everything changed. Luke, who was the author of the book of Acts, explained what happened on this, this particular day of Pentecost, 50 days after the death and burial of Jesus Christ. The disciples were gathered together in one place to worship God and to share fellowship together. And Luke begins the story with the words, when the day of Pentecost arrived. The day of Pentecost was a profound religious, uh, of profound religious importance to the Jews. The Passover celebration had a specific connection to the time of the Exodus and the freedom from slavery in Egypt. In Israel's history, the, the Passover feast was associated with the Day of Atonement, as well as a feast which marked the beginning of the harvest season, and that was the Feast of Weeks. Now, Pentecost is the Greek word, or the Greek term, for the Jewish Feast of Weeks. It is called Pentecost because it falls on the 50th day after the Passover. Even today, if you do the maths, Pentecost Sunday is 50 days after Good Friday. And Pentecost marked the beginning of the offering of first fruits. 
the New Testament uses the term Pentecost to refer to, to, refer to this ancient Jewish feast. But since the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church occurred on the day of Pentecost, we now recognize and celebrate the events which are described in Acts chapter 2 as Pentecost. It's the, it's the birth of the church as God's Spirit empowered those early Christians to have an impact on their world. The day of Pentecost was of such great importance in the Jewish calendar that every able-bodied Jew was required to go to Jerusalem for, for that occasion. Now, historians have estimated that up to 100,000 people would have journeyed to Jerusalem from all parts of the world to, to participate in these annual festivities. And this explains why so many people were in Jerusalem on that particular day, on this crucial moment as the Holy Spirit intervened in the life of the church. It was then that God chose to empower the church to become the agents of his grace and his redeeming love for the salvation of all mankind. And by sending his spirit, God spoke in a language which the people could understand. And he does so today as well. He still speaks to us in a language we can understand. We have the written word. We have the Bible. As Peter explained these strange events to these people, to, he referred to the scriptures, to the ancient scriptures. So Luke explains this phenomenon of the Spirit in a way which would have sparked familiar images with the people in the early church. For example, from the Old Testament creation account, we understand that the Spirit of God was present. This divine power was present before the foundations of the world and is referred to as the breath of God. The Hebrew word is ruach. It, it was then that God breathed his spirit into Adam and Eve. And this living relationship between the creator and his creatures started. The reference to the sound of a mighty wind blowing it sparks images of God breathing new life into his church. The breaking in of God's spirit on the day of Pentecost was felt by the whole house. Everybody who was there, who came to share in this time of fellowship and prayer and worship. Luke also makes reference to these tongues of fire which were seen on the heads of the people there that day. Fire has special significance in the Bible. For example, we're reminded of, of God's call and commissioning of Moses when he spoke to him through the burning bush. It also speaks of the presence and guidance of God through the pillar of fire when the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness. However, fire also speaks of God's wrath and his judgment. And we think here of Sodom and Gomorrah. There are the prophecies of the end time judgments which will, will, will bring this purifying fury of an unquenchable fire. We're also told in Acts chapter 2 that those who were there at Pentecost came under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now this wasn't just a brief feel-good session with no lasting consequences. Rather, this was the event which set into place God's historic plan of salvation for all people, regardless of their race, their gender, or any other difference. And everyone who was there surrendered completely to the power of the Spirit. So Acts chapter 2 begins with the coming of the Holy Spirit on the church. It was Pentecost, this dramatic day when the Spirit swept through the church like this mighty wind and these tongues of fire fell on the people who were there. And they were given the ability to speak in foreign languages, languages that they hadn't previously known. Before we get to the sermon which, which Peter preached, we, we see what happened before that. So this is from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. This is just before the reading we had earlier. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we, we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belong, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our, own lang in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. That 
Our reading earlier, Peter's response is from verse 14. And his response to them is his answer to the question which they're asking in verse 12. What does this mean? And that's the question we'll be answering today. What does it really mean? There are many who say that the meaning of Pentecost is that we should have the same experience as the disciples. In other words, we should be seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll get on to that. We should also be speaking in tongues. Most Christians have been asked this question at least once in their lives. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? There are also some who believe that if you haven't spoken in tongues, then there is something missing in your life as a Christian. Now this is why we need to have biblical answers to these things. And they've caused much controversy and even division in the church. We need to be able to answer the question, what is the meaning of Pentecost? Or as the people asked that day, what does this mean? What happened at Pentecost needs to be understood in terms of what happened in the previous chapter. In chapter 1 from verses 4 to 8. The context here is Ascension Day. This was 10 days before Pentecost. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What this means is that just as the ministry of Jesus depended on the Spirit descending on him at his baptism, so the ministry of the disciples depended on them receiving the Holy Spirit and relying on his power. The indwelling of the Spirit and his power would become a permanent reality. And that event took place at Pentecost. So what happened in Acts 2 is a unique historical event. It signified a new era in how God deals with his people. Pentecost signaled the dawning of the age of the Holy Spirit. And this is the age of the church in which we are still living today. The fullness of the Spirit in Christians and in the church is given in order to empower us and to empower the church to be effective witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The meaning of Pentecost is God equipping his church with the power of his spirit so that he will be glorified. The point of Pentecost is mission. And the goal of mission is that the gospel of Christ would be proclaimed throughout the world. What we need to remember is that up until this point, God's people consisted exclusively of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. But now, as the Christian church was established... Jews and Gentiles were included in the church as equals. We need to try and imagine for a moment just how radical this new beginning was. Because for thousands of years, God had worked out his covenant purposes through his chosen people, the Jews. But now suddenly everything changed, and these people struggled with this initially. The Apostle Paul called this inclusion of the Gentiles into the church a mystery. And he wrote this in Ephesians 3 verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What this means is that it's important for us to bear in mind that our purpose as the church is not to focus on ourselves and our own agendas. We are here for the benefit of people who are lost. Charles Spurgeon, he once said this, the church is a body created of the Lord to answer his own ends and purposes, and it exists for nothing else. And we are here to be part of the commission which Jesus has given his church, to share the gospel, and in so doing spread the knowledge of God to all the nations, beginning here in our own Jerusalem, if you like. In Acts 2 verses 9 to 11, we are given a long list of nations who were in Jerusalem for the annual feast of Pentecost. Now, this list is representative of the nations that God wants us to reach. Verse 5 says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. These devout men were in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, the festival of the harvest. They didn't know at the time that the long-awaited Messiah had come 
and had been sacrificed. And that was the whole point of Peter's sermon that day, to explain to them what had actually happened. There's also an interesting parallel between the, the events at Pentecost and what happened at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 10. At Babel, God judged the pride of those men by confusing their languages. But in a sense, he almost reversed it on the day of Pentecost, because there, by his grace, he performed a miracle by turning the confusion of languages from all these surrounding nations by making it possible for them to hear what was being said in their own, in their own mother tongues. This gift of speaking in tongues was a miracle which also reinforced God's intention for those early Christians to take the gospel to all the nations. It enabled the church to be established in those foreign lands when these men returned home. Because what happened at Pentecost was they heard the gospel being preached in their own languages. And that made it possible for them to go home and pass on that same message to their own people. So again, the gospel message is not for the Jews only, but for the Gentiles too. It's for all of the nations. Right at the end of Scripture, Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, speaking of Jesus, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And the task of the church remains the same today, to take the hope and the truth of the gospel to all. The big question is, how do we do that? And the answer is the power that we need to fulfill God's plan for his church comes in and through his Holy Spirit. We need to remember that the Holy Spirit is not just a force. He's the third person of the Trinity. We know that he is a person because Ephesians 4 verse 30 tells us we should not grieve the Holy Spirit. You cannot grieve a force or an impersonal entity. You can only grieve a person. And also in, in Acts 5 verse 3, Peter accused Ananias of lying to the Holy Spirit. And two verses later he says, you have not lied to men but to God. So he makes this clear connection between the Spirit and God. So the message is clear. The Holy Spirit of God is a person. Now, before the day of Pentecost, the Spirit indwelt and empowered people to serve God for specific purposes and at specific times. David, after being confronted with his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, it's his prayer of repentance. In verse 11, he cries out, he says, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. The truth to us today is that it is unnecessary for us to, to echo that prayer. In the days of the Old Testament, the Spirit did not permanently indwell all believers. But that changed at Pentecost. If we go back a few, uh, a few weeks, at the Last Supper, the night before Jesus was crucified, he said this to his disciples in John 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. There's the important word. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And this promise was fulfilled at Pentecost. And it's a promise which stands to this day. At the moment of your conversion, as God declares you to be fully justified in his sight, you receive the Holy Spirit in all of his fullness. All who believe in Jesus Christ receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. Romans 8 verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. You might remember from our series on Romans that the indwelling of the Spirit is the seal which guarantees our salvation. As a Christian, the Spirit of God dwells within you in all of his fullness. So to seek baptism of the Holy Spirit after being saved is not only unnecessary, but it's also a mistake. And this is where we see some of the confusing and, and controversial teachings on this, this subject. In Acts 1 verse 5, Jesus promised that the disciples would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that occurred on the day of Pentecost. And baptism, in this particular sense, 
It means being totally identified with the Spirit. It was the initial reception of the Spirit at Pentecost. There's an important detail we find in 1 Corinthians 12. And Paul wrote, writing it to the Corinthians church, this is from verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 12. In one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. The important point here is that the Christian church in Corinth had serious issues. It was a seriously divided church. They were immature. They were spiritual babes, if you like. So if baptism of the Holy Spirit is a special experience for the spiritually elite, Paul would not have written that to the Corinthian church. But he did. Not only that, nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because it's not an experience that we are supposed to be seeking. Rather, it is something which God does in the Christian at the moment of salvation. Now, that all being said, we are, though, commanded to be filled with the Spirit. But there is a difference. Being filled with the Spirit means allowing the Spirit to control our lives. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The disciples in the day of Pentecost were filled with the Spirit. So baptism with the Spirit is a once-off event at the moment of salvation. But being filled with the Spirit, that happens repeatedly. To be filled with the Spirit, we are to empty ourselves by confessing our sin and by dying to self and all those things. We need to learn to, to yield completely to God and to depend on Him step by step. It's also called walking in the Spirit. Colossians 3 verse 16 says, let the word see, there's a choice. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is much the same thing. As the word of Christ, as we allow, as we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, we are yielding to the work of the Spirit in our lives. The opposite of this is suppressing the work of the Spirit in our lives. And this is something we all struggle with in our ongoing battle against sin and temptation. The result of a consistent daily walk in the Spirit will be the fruit of the Spirit which manifests Himself in our lives and in our relationships too. We're very familiar with these words from Galatians chapter 5. The fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You notice that it's, that it's singular. It's never called, we tend to think of it sometimes as the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, all of those things. When we allow the, fruit, when we allow the Spirit to control our lives, the fruit of the Spirit manifests itself. So getting back to our question earlier, what does this mean? In other words, how does Pentecost apply to us today? Is this merely a place that we come to for an hour or so once a week? Or is this a place where we are connecting with our Christian brothers and sisters? Are we praying for one another? Are we encouraging one another to be faithful to Jesus' command? To go and make disciples of all nations? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Are we teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded us? The real message of Pentecost is not that it was just a wonderful day or the official birthday of the Christian church. The real message is that we are duty-bound and honor-bound to seek God's face, to seek the same passion that those early Christians had for the gospel, and to make ourselves available to God so that he can use his church today to bring glory to himself. And we do that by yielding to the power of the Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And that message has not changed and it still applies to us today. So it's not a repetition of Pentecost that we should be seeking. It's not a new Pentecost that we need. Rather, we need to understand that Pentecost has never ended. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your Spirit who empowers your church and leads us into all truth and to, into all righteousness. And Father, we confess that all too often we suppress the work of the Spirit in our lives. 
And in so doing, we're not effective in the way that we share the gospel. And that hinders the work of the church. And so we pray, Lord, that you give us a renewed passion for your word, for your truth, and for the gospel. Help us to share this message of hope with the lost, those who continue to resist your grace, that you would be glorified. And so that in and through your church, you bring glory to yourself. And use us, Lord, by the power of your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.